Um, if Charlie and Linda will come back up, we can answer some more questions if somebody could collect them for me. I have some left over from the first session, but if you have more questions, um, just write them down on the cards and somebody bring them. You can just bring them up directly or somebody could collect them. That'd be great. Um, one question that I got from people uh, just when I was milling around, and there's one on the card so I did, to help me remember, but this one's for Charlie about uh, the Zytase that's back there, says it expires in September of 2017, which I believe is now, but um, will it last longer than that? Uh, so the answer is that that stuff is gonna last for decades. <laughs> uh, these. These things uh, all have an expiration date for the packaging, uh, but you know, truthfully, most of your antibiotics will ask for, last for decades as well. The only antibiotic that you should not let degrade is the tetracyclines or doxycyclines because that can um, uh, actually have sort of a toxic effect, but almost anything else. These shelf lives are done just for approval, um, and they're very random. So anyway, that stuff's gonna last for decades. Uh, Dr. McClune, how does CRF compare to Zytase? Is it available for use? These are all being done in animal experiments at this time. So we were working on preclinical studies with a company, and uh, until it gets all the way through a clinical trial, it won't be available. And then um, maybe Mary can touch. Oh, about. go ahead. Go ahead. So the only Tom. comment I wanted to say about that is you're talking about very different approaches to the same kind of problem, which is, you know, we would like, what we'd really like is we'd like a, a switch that we could turn it on and turn it off, right? So we're looking at different ways to potentially prolong the effects of botulinum toxin. And uh, those are two very different ways. And I'm sure we're going to find other ones too. So I wouldn't think of, again, I, I would think of these as all as being different things in your armamentarium uh, to help yourself. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no problem. That's good. Um, good point. Has there been any research on the effect of fluorescent lights on blepharospasm? Several people asked me about this too. Mm -hmm. Mary, did you come across anything <clears throat> in your? You know, I did do a pretty yeah. thorough literature uh, search. I didn't come up with, I, I'm sorry, I didn't come across anything specific to fluorescent fluorescent lights, I always fi find um, reference to that they're especially disturbing, uh, but I didn't find any specific research around that. Charlie, what do you tell patients? Because I hear that all the time, that fluorescent lights really bother them more than, you know, other ambient lights. I, I also hear that, and so I tell them, avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> Turn them off. Turn yeah, them off. I mean, figure out what are your triggers, as you've heard and try to find ways to avoid those triggers. And we have fluorescent lights in our office, and often I will go in a room and they'll have turned off the lights. Great, that's great, turn off the lights. We don't need them on. Do you have a question related? Yeah, and I think some of that is the FL41 tint is probably trying to help get it to the right, the right tint and the right um, amount of light so that uh, you, you aren't so bothered. And interestingly, the FL41 was originally developed for migraine sufferers, sufferers who also have photophobia. Um, and those two resources that Mary gave are great. I know Exxon Optics will send you glasses to try, and if you don't like them, you can send them back and they'll refund uh, your money. But um, those are excellent, excellent suggestions. Thank you. All right, a couple more. Let's see. There were several on eyelid surgery, and I'll let Charlie answer, and I can chime in too if you'd like, about... Um, uh, one, would you do eyelid surgery for hemifacial spasm? So, um, I think it depends on the individual. And I hate to keep saying this, but if you have droopy eyelid on both sides and you can uh, do droopy eyelid surgery, you can clean up extra eyelid skin, surgery itself is not going to be effective for hemifacial spasm of the eyelid. You know, it's really a problem with the nerve um, affecting the whole face. 
Uh, do you have anything else? I wouldn't do a uh, hemi-myectomy. I wouldn't do a myectomy on one side if that was the question. So I think, you know, Ali, when he gave his talk, he showed somebody that he had done unilateral surgery, but I think it was like Charlie said, it's usually a blepharoplasty and ptosis repair and things like that to, that have been affected by the constant spasm. Um, but I agree. I have done unilateral myectomies on some patients that had severe spasm. On one e side? On one side. I think I've sent the specimens to Linda because I probably did bilateral surgery, but I did myectomy on one side rather than the other. Um, and then comments, somebody asked a comment on ptosis surgery in blepharospasm patients, anything you do differently or So the big look at? comment about that is, you know, I try to do as little eyelid surgery in blepharospasm patients as possible because any surgery that you do, um, if it's not going to help the blepharospasm, will make the injections more painful afterwards because there'll be scar tissue. So if it's going to be helpful for the blepharospasm, absolutely do it. If we're just doing it for you know some subtle cosmetic work or whatever, then let's not. Droopy eyelid repair is minimal surgery and leaves very little scarring. And the issue for me about droopy eyelid in a, in a blepharospasm patient is that if your eyelid is quite droopy, um, then you have less room to potentially have error with your botulinum toxin. So a, it's easier for you to get droopy eyelid with your botulinum toxin if there's already a droopy eyelid. Uh, so I, that, that's the big issue for me. You have any comments about that? No, I agree. That's uh, similar. And then the other, the last surgical question was, is it generally, um, to do a myectomy at the same time of a blepharoplasty if you're going to do a blepharoplasty on somebody with uh, blepharospasm? And so the answer is, uh, of course, if you're doing a blepharoplasty anyway, uh, you might consider doing a myectomy. And again, you should focus the myectomy on the patient's problem. If they're having pseudoapraxia, then you want to take out more pretarsal um, muscle. If it's more spastic, then you'd like to take out a little bit more of the preceptal, preorbital um, avicularis. And then I wanted to ask a question to Mary. What are some research, I mean, I'm lucky we have Mary here who's amazing, uh, does amazing low vision work, but are there some resources for people in other parts of the country where they can find people, not exactly you, nobody's gonna be <laughs> as good as Mary is here, but other people around the country who do your kind of work? Uh, sure, so you know, every state, has a state services for the blind, and some organization like that. Um, they're they're going to be a little confused by your situation. I'm going to say that um, because they have their criteria, and 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 your situation is going to be unique to them. But I think there could be a real argument made that you should qualify for those services. So that would be one door to knock on. Um, I wish I had a website in front of me. Um, you know, honestly, if you Google <laughs> low vision services in your area, you're going to come up with some various, uh, various organizations or hospitals or outpatient clinics that offer low vision rehab. And I'm sorry, I'm blanking on a website that would be especially helpful. So if there's a way to uh, include that in information later, I will. Google. Yeah, yeah, say, hey, Google. <laughs> Find me. Lighthouse for the Blind is all over the country. Well, and sure, Lighthouse for the Blind, too. That's right. And, and you know, a comment that I make to the blepharospasm patients is that your situation is almost worse than somebody who's truly blind because sometimes you're sighted and sometimes you aren't. And so you never really learn, and Mary mentioned this before, you never really learn how to, to work when you aren't sighted because you aren't forced to. Um, and so it makes it even more challenging than for somebody who's always low sighted. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I just thought I would make that observation. Mm -hmm. All right, I think this is a good one for everybody. We'll have Linda start. What does the panel suggest the best area for future blepharospasm related research? Uh, well, my long, uh, Andy's and my long-term colleague, uh, John Werchafter, said once that it, if you can work local rather than systemic, that that was 
the way to focus how you think about treatments. We're doing the same thing for some eye movement disorders. And so the goal is to, you know, at least from my perspective, and I, certainly some of the work that um, Charlie is doing is in the same vein as how can you t try to target the things that you're thinking about might be effective, but be as localized as you can, so to minimize the potential uh, side effects that might just affect your other, uh, act, the muscle activity in other parts of your body. So my, I've got a little different take on it. <laughs> of course, we do different things. Right. Um, yes, um, good, right? And, and so I would say that the big problem, and I tried to allude to this in those little cartoons, is our processing, the brain's processing. And if we can figure out, I, I would, if you have money to donate someplace, go ahead and donate to these guys. But I would say we really need to think hard about what's different in the brain than it is in the rest of the body uh, or in the normal people's, normal pe other people's brains. Um, and, and if we can solve that problem, we aren't just solving blepharospasm, we're solving all of the dystonias. So that's... That's what I would love to see more research in, is in the neurology, the neurobiology of what's happening. Do you have any comments? It's hard. It's, hard. it's a, very hard. Otherwise, it would be done. <laughs> right, right. Well, and, and I think, as I said, as far as research in low vision specific to blepharospasm, um, I actually found very little information. And it was primarily on uh, studies that looked at depression uh, at the FL41 tint. Um, I, it, there was absolutely zero research on sort of the day-to-day -day management uh, of, of blepharospasm. So again, just sort of highlighting sort of the crack that, that a person can fall through, right? Oh, um, great. Thank you. So, so uh, that was my experience in looking at the medical literature. All right, and I, again, I want to thank the BBRF for all they do to support research for you guys and to help support us and allow us to do these kind of projects because they are expensive. Research is expensive. It doesn't seem like it would be expensive to have a couple rabbits <laughs> in a little thing and put some stuff in their lids and and then, but it takes many, many people and housing and multiple, um, through the University of Minnesota, we have a whole animal protocol. So it, it all takes time and money. And so it's, it's amazing what this organization does for people. Um, and then a couple more questions for Charlie about dry eye stuff that came up. Is fish oil as effective as omega-3 to improve the quality of tears? So omega-3 oils come from fish. Um, and so when you're taking fish oil, you're really taking omega-3 oil. Now, you can get omega-3 oils from some plants, but the more ready, ready supply is from fish. Uh, again, I just make the comment, you want to make sure you're getting a good, safe, fish oil or omega-3 oil. How about flaxseed versus omega-3? So I think, those are, I think flaxseed and omega-3 oils are synergistic. That is, that they both have a benefit by themselves. I think together the benefit is even greater. Uh, I can't stand uh, flaxseed oil. I, I can't stand the taste of it. I can't stand the smell of it. Um, and I would caution people from grinding their own flaxseed uh, if you're male because the, the seed capsule for flaxseed is a phytoestrogen, and so you'll be getting a lot of estrogen. And so if you've got breast cancer, for example, also you want to stay away from, uh, if you've got the right kind or wrong kind of breast cancer, uh, from that capsule. Um, it's like soy. It's a phytoestrogen. Um, but I, I think that the combination is very effective. And, you know, I have no interest in this particular company, but if you're looking for a good fish oil, I really like Carlson's Lab. Uh, you can get it on the internet. Um, it doesn't give you that after burp. Uh, it comes in two different flavors, and it's palatable. And you can take it as a capsule. The flaxseed you should take as an oil, or ground up seed. But the um, you have to take a, about three times to four times the amount of ground up seed as you get the oil. And then a couple more dry eye questions, because you you spoke about autoimmune dry eye, and the, the question was how would you find out that your dry eye is due to an autoimmune condition? So somebody else asked me this earlier. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that cause dry eye. It's very common. 
And not everybody who's got dry eye has blepharospasm, and not everybody who's got dry eye has autoimmune disease. But we do know that most of the autoimmune diseases are associated with a dry eye problem. And for some of them, we understand why, because the antibody that you um, are having a problem with actually attacks some of the glands that produce the tears in and around the eye. So my answer to the question is, how would you know you're likely to have other symptoms and signs throughout your body if you have a significant autoimmune disease, and it won't be a question. Do you have severe rheumatoid arthritis? Do you have lupus, uh, Wegener's? Some of these other diseases you will know because you've got other problems. Uh, and you know the management is pretty much the same unless you have a severe autoimmune disease in which you're gonna be on immunomodulation therapy anyway. So things that turn down inflammation. So I don't think you need to go looking for really powerful immunomodulation for your dry eye. And then uh, continuing on dry eye, I'm just going to bring up what you saw this uh, guy bring up to me. And I, this is something that I've recommended for patients as well, is this GLAD press and seal. Charlie, I don't know if you've used it, but it's a GLAD product. I have no financial interest in the GLAD company, nor do I know where it resides. But um, the press and seal is a food preservative um, film you put over your um, food after you've eaten it, I guess, and want to keep it for later. But it works really well as a nighttime, instead of taping your eye closed at night, and somebody actually just wrote this up in our literature for patients with thyroid eye disease whose eyes are too wide open, but especially right after you've had your Botox and your eyes aren't closing well, you basically can cut it to fit, and he has it here on a piece of paper, and you can cut out a bunch of them and keep them next to your bed and use it to close your eye at night instead of tape, and it works, it works really well. You need to make sure you seal it pretty tight so that your eye doesn't open up at night and rub against it and cause any corneal irritation, but I've recommended this for a lot of patients with facial nerve palsies and thyroid, um, not as much in blepharospasm. I don't know, Charlie, do you, do you have any so suggestions? So I recently heard you speak about this, and, <laughs> and I hadn't tried it before then, but then uh, I started recommending it to people. And for some folks that had problems with it sticking well, they told me that wearing swimming goggles um, on top of it was really helpful. So I, I can only report what they've told me. And you know that makes, that makes a final point I'd like to make, and I said this to somebody earlier, that everything that we know about your disease, you guys taught us, and the foundation taught us from our experience. And so the more you communicate to us and tell us what things worked for you, the more you write into the foundation and put your letters in the newsletter, the more we all learn. That's Did everybody hear her question? The question yep. is, go ahead. go ahead. No, 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 you repeat it. So, so, so the question was that the comment was made that topical anesthetics decrease the efficacy of the Botox, and she was saying it is absolutely the only thing that makes it tolerable for her. And then the other part of the question was, have we ever had Botox? And I've never had Botox. Um, but it's not that you can't use the topical anesthetic, you just have to use a different dose. And that was the point. And if you're going from uh, practitioner to practitioner, um, and you are, some people use it and some people don't, then you're going to find your dose changes. Anything, anybody want to reveal whether they've used Botox or not? <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> no, I have not used Botox either. And I do use occasionally in some of my patients here who have it and have to have the uh, cream and we will have to alter like Charlie said I think you do have to alter the dose the same I have some people who like to have cool compresses before um, And I think you know again sometimes you have to change your dose or um, Have them exercise or things like that, but since we know it does increase sprouting I'm thinking about getting intracranial injections. I could use a little bit more <laughs> Intracranial Botox. I don't have any questions on that <laughs> 
Um, and then another question, uh, Linda, you could start, I can answer too. When will human trials start on the Botox additives? How about you? As soon as we get enough money to finish our <laughs> mice, rabbit, monkey, human <laughs> studies. That's probably the answer to that. And then Charlie, what about the Zytase? The, I mean, it's really out, that is available, right? and it seems to be efficacious. I have several patients that use it and have found some use for it. I think you can find it in most uh, mm -hmm. pharmacies now. You can talk to the... So the story about it. that, and I, you know, I, I don't like to talk about it too much because I don't want people to think that I'm pushing something that they don't need. Um, we can buy it, the physicians can buy it in bulk um, at about $30 a box and sell it at that same price if we choose to. You can buy it yourself on the internet for about $35 to $38 from the company. You can get it from the pharmacy from somewhere between $50 to $80. Um, and sometimes some of the insurance companies will cover it. So it really depends on your insurance company whether they will cover it or not. But if they are not covering it, then I would say don't go to the pharmacy for it. All right, I, there was one more question about Botox. I can ask this one and then if anybody, we probably have time for one or two more. Is there a location the Botox is injected that will help with light sensitivity? <laughs> um, I, I think that the greatest um, thing that I can do with light sensitivity is to maximize the tear film. I don't okay. have a particular place that I would think of to give Botox that would in, uh, decrease light sensitivity. What do you think, Andy? Totally agree. I, you know, light sensitivity is really, it's a difficult problem. Um, and some of it's related to tear film and surface. And some of it is probably some other brain, processing. brain process that, you know, we can't treat with Botox, at least at this point, unless we do Charlie's intracranial Botox. Um, but there, there was that interesting study, you know, John McCann did years yeah. ago where they treated it like reflex sympathetic dystrophy is a pain that sometimes people get along a nerve and he, he thought maybe photophobia was uh, similarly caused and they injected a ganglion in the neck and they, with uh, local anesthetic and did have some temporary relief. There's no, there haven't been any other studies that have duplicated that nor has there been any long-term treatment with anything else but it's kind of interesting that it's probably a higher order process. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say it because it's a higher order visual response that the localized response probably wouldn't help. But as somebody who has a, a dry eye and, and photophobia, not buffer spasm, I close one eye and it actually helps for me a ton. And there have been studies, in fact, John Wirtschafter did, I think his very first publication was on, on just this issue. And if you, if you, you know, I can only close the left eye you know, voluntarily for whatever weird reason, but if I go out into light and I just can't see, I just close one eye and it, I find it works for me, so. Yeah. Any other questions that people can? Massaging the, the oil glands. So you're massaging out here on the ends. Oh, um, so the, there are several different kinds of glands that affect, that produce components of the tears. Um, if you have significant stase, you have a significant constipation of your oil glands, um, for some people it's helpful to massage the eyelid margin to squeeze some of that oil out. I would let your eye doctor advise you whether that's worthwhile or not. You don't want to be doing it if it's not going to be helping you because it will create more inflammation um, around the eyes. I'm not aware of anybody who can massage their glands up here, mostly because the glands up here are behind the bone where you can't reach them. Um, so, I, I, so the question is about permanently plugging the tear ducts. So what they plugged was your tear drain, right? 
And so for people who have dry eye, plugging the tear drains can be very effective. You have two in the upper eyelids, one in each eye, and two in the lower eyelids. Again, you have to be careful that you don't make toxic tear worse. So you have to be treated, treating your eyelid issues first, and then you can close them. And you can do them with temporary silicone plugs, or you can do it permanently by cauterizing them. And again, I would let your eye doctor help guide you in that direction. I know one other thing I wanted to mention. You know, there's, people think it's kind of funny that when you hum or you sing or you move your mouth, you have a little bit more trouble, more facility with keeping your eyes open. I would guess that the vast majority of women in this room, as they were growing up, when they put their makeup on, open their mouths. There is a clear connection between the mouth and the eye. And we see that particularly in some children that have what's something that's called a jaw wink phenomenon, that when they move their mouth, their eyes flutter up and down. And so there is a clear reason and some, some evidence that there is a connection between the eyes and the mouth. I just wanted to follow up on your smile comment. And um, Mary's talk reminded me of this. There's a uh, Vietnamese Buddhist monk. I'm sure I'm going to butcher his name. Thich Nhat, Thich Nhat Hanh or Thich Nhat. I never can remember. That's it. Thich Nhat Hanh, who um, talks a lot about smiling as causing happiness. So when you move your facial musculature to create a smile, it actually activates in your brain to help you feel better and... and That's that neuroplasticity. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So that, that follows the neuroplasticity, which there is this... There are several... I don't know if they're physicians or um, therapists who are working with people doing these types of maneuvers repeatedly and have um, shown some promise with blepharospasm mm -hmm. as well. Um, and then finally, I wanted to add one, one more thing on smile, and I'd be interested to hear Charlie's take on this. We had several patients that after we um, injected Botox or had had bot botulinum toxins injected had noticed a change in their smile because the muscles, as you saw from those, um, all those anatomy slides, the muscles that close the eye are very close to the muscles that control your lips and, your, and move your, move your uh, upper lip up. And several patients noted that after their injections that they lost those smiles. So we actually did a study which looked at that and we didn't find much difference, at least in our injections, that we had a lot of change in smile with botulinum toxin injections. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. So I hear about it occasionally um, from people get it injected elsewhere. There is a muscle called the levator labi superioris, which runs right along the side of the nose um, and down to the top of the lip towards the middle. And if your muscle comes up high and if your injection is low, uh, then you will hit that, and you will have a droop of the middle uh, part of the lip, um, and it will last as long as botulinum toxin lasts. Most commonly, uh, when you get an effect that you don't want from botulinum toxin, it's because it's spread a little bit farther than you wanted, and typically that goes away faster than the area that you really intended to inject. Would you say that's true, Andy? Yeah, usually I tell patients if you do get a ptosis or double vision, that usually goes away within weeks, usually, and the toxin lasts months in general. That's not for everybody. Well, I think that, oh, we have a couple more quick questions, and then we'll be. So, yes, F making the muscles fire, or the nerves fire to make, simulate the muscle function um, seems to increase the efficacy of the Botox. Um, the question about whether you massage it afterwards, whether that makes a difference, I think it depends greatly on the dilution. As I was explaining to some other folks, the botulinum toxins, um, all the toxin A, are sold in a, a freeze-dried powder and then we add solution to it to determine what, what, what uh, volume and concentration we're going to use. And if you dilute it a fair amount, then you have a lot of fluid for the amount of toxin that you're putting in. And if any fluid that you inject, if you press on it, it will spread. So if you are trying to get a specific area 
and you're using a fairly dilute solution, then it will spread. And you can alter the effects. And that may be desirable, that may not be desirable. It depends on your situation. Uh, and similarly, if I hit a blood vessel and I have bleeding, bruising, that's bl blood under the, the skin, it can carry the toxin uh, as well. And so I can get a spread of effect which may or may not be desirable for that person.